Good morning. I have the pleasure to moderate this morning this very interesting series of uh, lectures uh, given by um, three very uh, competent and well-known persons. Um, we shall have the two of them together and um, after a coffee break we shall have the third one followed by a round table discussion. This is the agenda for the morning. And um, uh, I would like to invite to call Professor Olaf Kuhne from the University of Tübingen to take the floor. A uh, very quick introduction for those among us that uh, are, uh, need some, uh, something more than just a well-known name. Uh, Professor Kuhne is originally uh, of a training of geographer and then uh, sociologist. Uh, he works in the Department of Regional and uh, Urban Development uh, Sociology of Landscape. Uh, of course, he's uh, the author of a very well-known uh, entitled Landscape and Power, and uh, if I may define in uh, three words the field of uh, uh, his research is landscape, power, infrastructure. So we shall uh, uh, be happy to hear more than three words about that. Uh, you have uh, one hour to develop your topic, and we can um, have a very uh, short discussion at the end of it, uh, just uh, if you have some questions to address to Professor um, Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be here. Um, the topic of my presentation will be landscape and power. Um, as you already heard, it's uh, the main topic of my research. The content, content of my presentation will be this short introduction. Then I will switch over to some typical sociological remarks about power, but do not have here, it's just one slide. Um, after this, I will switch over a little bit more to philosophy, and I will talk about uh, the aesthetic construction of the world. Um, it's uh, one subdiscipline. Aesthetics is one subdiscipline of philosophy, beside ontology, epistemology, and ethics. And it's the fourth one, and it's very important one. Especially, I will talk about it later in the times of uh, postmodernism. But before I will talk about postmodernism, I will talk to landscape, um, how um, people, how society constructs landscapes and now you can see my world view concerning landscape or society as a social constructivist approach at fifth i will talk about uh, the different uh, logics of constructing landscapes it's caused by our discussion yesterday in the afternoon uh, when we talked about uh, the different logics of dealing with landscape and uh, this i will uh, 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 talking about a little bit more detailed. Last but not least, before I come to the summary, I will talk a little bit about postmodern times. It's also linked to our discussion yesterday afternoon, and uh, here we ha will have the consequences of my talk. So, at first, some remarks to power. Heinrich Popitz, who is uh, one of the sociologists in Germany who dealt the most uh, with power in the last uh, 50 years, um, uh, said that power is not God-given and not bound in might, or it's not a natural necessity, it, it's a work of man. And what is very important, 
every social relationships a ship is concerned and may be founded by power. And so we have the classical definition by Max Weber. Um, he says that um, power is an opportunity, an opportunity to force other people to act like they want. And it's very important, that's a second important word here, or expression, the social relationship. Any power relationships is caused by social relationships. Imagine yourself if uh, Donald Trump would be left on a lonely island without any people, without any mobile phone or something like that, would he have some power? No. So power is founded in social relationships. And uh, a quotation I very like because it's uh, uh, very, deep, uh, very strongly in contact with science, is the definition of uh, Karl Deutsch. Uh, power has the one who can afford to have not to, to learn anything. So we have a very intensive connection between power and knowledge. And it's not a new, um, uh, new thing we decided or we, we, we understand. Uh, the first who dealt with this topic, the very um, strong relationship between power and knowledge was an Italian, you know, everybody knows him, Machiavelli. Now I will switch over to the aesthetical construction of the world and uh, uh, we have also here in this aesthetical construction of the world a strong relationship to power as you will see. At first I would like to talk about some tradition lines of aesthetics of the sub-discipline of philosophy of aesthetics. At first we have the duality between an object orientation and a sub uh, subject orientation. What does it mean? People who are thinking that the aesthetics of an object is part of this object, uh, object orientated. The other part of uh, the, the scientific world is thinking that the object do not have any aesthetic quality is in subscription by people who are acting. And people who are acting, we just talked about a few minutes ago, are concerned and related to power. Then we have the discussion. What is the beauty? We started to think about this uh, in the Greek antique, but uh, the more impo uh, modern thinking about uh, the beauty started in the 19th uh, excuse me, in the 17th century, and uh, uh, Immanuel Kant says the beauty is what we like without any interest. Interest is mean financial interest. But we have other modes of dealing with aesthetics. For example, the ugly, the non-beauty. All the sublime, uh, Hume started to think about the sublime, the things that are impressing ourselves, and at last but not least here, the pittoresque, and a famous picture of the pittoresque you can find here is Caspar David Friedrich, The Lonely Oak, and you have the relationship, the play between the beauty and the midground and the sublime with the mountains um, on the uh, rear ground as well the, the, the clouds who are very impressive. So we have this, this playing with, with the beauty and the sublime, which we call this, the, the pittoresque. Another discussion in the philosophic uh, subdiscipline of aesthetics is uh, the question, if human beings are only producing the beauty or the beauty can be found in nature. And it's very important in the discussion concerning landscape. The real beautiful landscape, is this a cultural landscape or a natural landscape? The same we have back to the object orientation. Landscape is only 
a judgment, a subscription of the beautiful or the ugly or something else, or it is a part of this landscape. Then we have the discussion, are we really able to understand the beauty by cognition? Or we have a rest of sensuality and emotion we cannot really describe. And the fifth discussion we have in the discipline is the high culture, it's art, and the trivial culture, it's kitsch. Can landscapes be kitschy? Important question, we may discuss later. I will switch over, as I said, I'm a social constructivist, so um, I have a strong relationship to subject-orientated aesthetics, and here we can find one of the earlier philosophers who are dealing with this, and he says, uh, it's Fischer, he says, beauty is not a thing, but an act. I going into a relationship with some objects and I subscribe them as beautiful. And objects are creating a feeling of pleasure, uh, of pleasure in my personality, in myself. And so, and that is the interesting thing, not for uh, philosophers, but all, also for so uh, sociologists, who has to decide what is the beauty thing? Or, here, we, uh, Hartmann, the philosopher, says, the intellectual abilities are deciding what is a, beauty, a beautiful thing, which is an ugly thing. So we come to the topic of aesthetics and taste, and now we are back to the discussion of kitsch. Because kitsch is the description of something as beautiful a part of the society which can decide what is beautiful and what is not beautiful, do not describe as beautiful. We are, sta uh, we are, we are starting to understand that uh, social constructivism is not so easy. Now I go to the social constructivist approach. I will get to go back every time to the aesthetics. If we discuss about landscape theory, we can find that we have around these four principal approaches. At first, the essentialist approach, what does it mean? The essentialist thinks that landscape has an own personality. And all we can find in the physical space is an expression of this own personality. And if we are looking back to the history of science, we can see that this is a medieval thinking of the world. Then we have the classical positivist approach. It started with the Enlightenment, the emergence of uh, natural sciences. They are thinking that we have a real world and we can measure them with empirical methods. Critical rationalism says, we can be sure there is something like a real world, and we can describe the real world as a landscape, for example, but we can never be sure, and we can never be proof that that what we are describing, what we are writing about landscape, is fitting the so-called reality. It's the next, next step is a constructive approach. For example, social constructivism. I will talk about a little bit more about this later because this is my approach. It means that we are discussing about one topic and we decide from generation to generation what is true. And we try to find some uh, things in the exterior world that dec we dis declare as truth. More interesting is uh, still, or more radical, sure, is the radical constructivism. And radical uh, constructivism says there's only communication. 
there is nothing like a real landscape or real physical object. A real physical object only exists when we are communicating about this object. So, landscape only is an idea of social communication. And discourse theory is more focused on this communication systems. And in discourse theory, we discuss what is the real, true landscape and which not. Which discourse have a hegemony? I will come to this later. The hegemony, this is a landscape, this is a beautiful landscape, and this is a landscape we do not want to have. And who has the right to decide which is the beautiful or the ugly landscape? I come back to the social construction of landscape. The social construction of landscape, every knowledge we have in the society about landscape is a social product. This is the basis of social constructivism. We are talking about landscape, we are talking about which physical objects we can declare as a landscape. We have a process of socialization, and it's very differentiated, I will talk about this later. And we teach the upcoming generation what we can call landscape, what we can call a beautiful landscape, an ugly landscape, and so on. So, landscape is no longer a physical object, but a social product. And what is very important, this is a typical sociological thinking, if we are talking about landscape, and we judge a physical space as landscape, um, we can gain social acceptance, or we can lose social acceptance. If you go back, I don't know, 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, and uh, you go to the British Midlands, see some steelworks and say, oh, what a beautiful landscape, this will be reduce your social acceptance. Today, it changed a little bit, and that's the important thing, or one of the important things, landscape views, landscape uh, paradigms, are changing. So when we discuss about the social construction of landscape, we know we have different dimensions. Very important, the social dimension. In the social dimension, we have all the knowledge about that that we call landscape. Which objects we can choose to build a landscape? I will talk about uh, this a little bit later. Which stereotypes we have from a landscape? I've shown the picture, the romantic picture of uh, Caspar David Friedrich. And uh, very important, especially for German, thinking about a beautiful landscape is the landscape paint tree, for, uh, for especially by Caspar David Friedrich. So this is the main, the founding level of declaring what is a landscape. It's a social landscape when you're argumentating as a social constructivist. But everybody of us knows there are differences. Everybody of us has a special history of being socialized. We are coming from different cultures. Okay, they are all European. But if you have a look what means landscape in Germany or in England, you find some differences. Or in France, it's more aesthetic. In Germany, landscape is everything. Region, landscape, aesthetic landscape. It's a, an expression you can declare everything as, nearly. You cannot in France, for example. But we have a personal history. We are coming from a specific milieu. So we have everybody of us has specific actualizations of what we uh, have learned about landscape. So, the next level is the appropriated physical landscape. Physical landscape, or the physical space, is everything, what is physical, what is material in the world. It's the fourth level, I will talk about it later. And for example, we have this nice picture. 
It's uh, Lake Tahoe in uh, uh, northeastern uh, California. And if you think about what is landscape in this picture, it's not every needle of the tree or every corn of sand or something like this. Not even not every tree, because we summarize these trees here as a forest. So we have specific understanding and s building synthesis what we can call landscape and what we call a beautiful landscape. This is the fourth dimension, and the f this fourth dimension of the physical space, the material world, is the difference between the social constructivist and the radical constructivist approach. The, uh, the social constructivist approach, it's my approach I, I, I already talked about, is to accept that we have a material world. But this material world is not the landscape. We have a material world, but we are choosing some elements of this uh, physical world to declare them as a landscape. Now we are talking about, I will talking about a, bit, a little bit uh, of the things we have already talked about yesterday in the afternoon, the different landscape logics. Here I'm coming back to the sociology of Nicholas Luhmann, um, who died uh, five years ago, and he uh, um, not invented systems theory in social sciences, but uh, he modernized social uh, system theory, which was founded in the 40s by Talcott Parsons in the United States. So, Nicholas Luhmann uh, declares that the world is decided, the modern world, Nicholas Luhmann is talking about the modern world, is divided in s several subsystems, and these subsystems have, uh, have to solve specific social problems. For example, the political system is dealing with, the, with public matters, the jurisdiction um, is uh, responsible for the law, um, the economy uh, controls how we are uh, getting goods and services, very important for Nicholas Luhmann, we are defining the truth as scientists today in the post-fact uh, uh, society. It's not uh, the case. And last but not least, uh, mass media is keeping news and deciding what is new and what is important. The problem concerning landscape, not only landscape as well as environment, ecological problem, pollution and so on, is that we have no social system which is dealing exclusively with our environment. So, if you are uh, working in the economy, you want to gain money from the natural, uh, natural resources. If you are a politician, you want to get or to remain power concerning uh, the natural environment or landscape. An example I'm working very intensively about is um, the energy transition in Germany and other European countries. We are implementing lots of windmills uh, in the so-called landscape, in the physical space we call landscape. And as long as we have no citizens' initiatives against these um, windmills, it was not very important for politics. But now it changed. Landscape is getting a more and more important topic for politics because you can lose power. Very important for Germany is um, Bavaria. They started in Bavaria with the an enthusiastic view, the politics, concerning the energy transition. And after two, year, two years, they changed their worldview completely because there were much protests in the population. What is very important for uh, Nicholas Luhmann, and perhaps you will find, um, as me as well, that this point of view is a little bit historic because we're coming to the postmodern thinking about uh, landscape in, I don't know, 10 minutes. 
Here, mass, uh, Nicholas Luhmann is thinking that mass media have a very important role in communication between politics, for example, or economy and the society. Because mass media, especially TV, but also journals and so on, have the possibility to have a direct way to the whole population. Usually, when you are talking about economy, you are talking to other economists. When you are a politician, you try to come into the journals and so on, and to TV, but usually you are talking to other politicians. That's the difference between mass media and every specialized social system. And if you start um, to think about mass media, you can see that some themes, some topics are starting to be discussed in the whole po population after one special point. In Germany, it's very famous um, concerning um, the climate change. It was perhaps somebody knew about uh, knew the um, journal, the Spiegel. In the year 1986, they had a title page with the Cathedral of, of Cologne, everybody knows in Germany, standing into the North Sea and the uh, sea up to the roof. And they say, this is the future if we do not change our energy consumption. Up to this date, the climate change was a discourse of, of some specialized scientists and some specialized politicians. But from this point, the whole society knew something about the climate change and its consequences. So it is very important to bring the information to mass media. But what is very problematic in society that mass media, I'm talking to the days up to starting the internet uh, and Facebook and so on, um, it integrates a medium of moral. What you can, how you can act as a human being, what is allowed in the society. Decided, I always said decided, perhaps up to the early uh, zero years, mass media. In former days it was the church, but the church lost, especially in Protestant countries, their, uh, its function as uh, the system of moral, so it transformed to mass media. Today we do not have such a system of integrating moral because we every time are on Facebook and uh, you know the term of shitstorm. Now I come to the different social construction of landscape. The problem talking about landscape is we are talking about two different things. At first, individual objects in the material world are usually in Western society owned by private people, but landscape as an aesthetic picture um, is dealt as a common good. So we have conflicts between the common good um, uh, idea and the individual ownerships. And when we're talking about the social construction of landscape, with which needs we do have in society, we can find five dimensions. And they are very different um, between experts and lay people. At first, especially um, experts have a cognitive view to landscape. They try to understand the processes in the space we call landscape. And we have a functional idea concerning landscape. Uh, a space we call landscape has, for example, the function of health, has a function of producing fresh air, or something like this. But when we talk to no, so-called normal people, which needs they address to what we call landscape. It's emotion. We yesterday talked about uh, Heimat, the feeling of home in uh, a space we call landscape. Aesthetic uh, 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 needs and also functional needs. Now I just need to uh, <laughs> Have a, to make a reference to the Bavarian dialect because even in German this uh, 
word or this uh, expression does not work, it uh, called taugt is mir. It is fitting to my needs, perhaps, but it's an individual need to go to, for a walk, to have an aesthetic impression or feeling like home. It's a, a personal function. It's completely different to the expert's function concerning landscape. I just talked about laymen and uh, normal people, and if you have a look to these lay people, they have a very uh, interesting way of socializing what we call landscape. At first, the native landscape. It's a landscape we are born in. It's a surrounding of our parents' houses um, or apartment and so on. And in he especially in school, in films, in TV and so on, we are growing, we are socialized by a second uh, landscape, the stereotypical typical landscape. And here we can see the typical German stereotyped landscape. It's a bellowing deer. Up to now, it's a little bit uh, kitschy because it changed. What is very important, um, the native landscape does not need to be stereotypically beautiful. It must be familiar. So I refuse every changes of the physical um, world because it's changing my home. Because it's changing what we call landscape. What is very interesting, but we have an intensive intergenerational change. Now, in nowadays, I change a physical surrounding. People who know the older surrounding are refusing a new one, but the next generation uh, is for, for, for the next generation, it is the normal landscape. The average population, what does it mean? It's a German uh, uh, investigation. What is part of a landscape? Woods, meadow, brooks, villages, farms, sands, and atmospheres. What is not motorways, cities, wind generators, and so on. And we can see it's a little bit like the old romantic landscape. I also ask people what they are thinking about these pictures. And if we see what people are thinking, we see they think that the Gao landscape is beautiful, the industrial landscape is ugly. It was. I repeated this investigation last year, and now only 20% are thinking this landscape is ugly. Why? The landscape concept, the ideas of landscape are changing very, very quickly. The open landscape with windmills um, are described as modern or ugly. But what is in very interesting, who is describing them as modern and who is ugly? Modern, young, well-educated women and ugly, old, conservative men. Perhaps you're reminded to Donald Trump, I don't know. In his, uh, uh, also in universities, um, we have uh, different ideas what is an affordable and uh, landscape we should arrive. At first, we have a paradigm of the re restoration of uh, appropriated physical, cultural landscape, go back to the 1850s and uh, have such a way of landscape. Then we have the idea of the secessionistic landscape, everything should uh, develop as uh, natural or economical. Especially in landscape architecture, we have a paradigm of a reflexive design. Uh, with land art, we can change the way of seeing landscape. And a typical sociological interpretation of landscape is the last one. Um, to reinterpret social landscape, to change the view to what we call landscape. 
industrial landscape does not need to be ugly, but they can also be sublime, perhaps as well as windmills. We have to discuss. What is very important, uh, and now it is just a remark to our academic praxis, um, that we declare as professors some we call landscape as uh, the real landscape we need to reach or to, to design. And so we bring our ideas to the next generation. Okay, at last, uh, I will talk a, bit about, a little bit about the governance uh, of landscape in postmodern times. At first, some remarks concerning postmodernity. Uh, what does it mean? Postmodernity does not mean that uh, it's an era after modern times, but it's uh, related to modern times. What is important? The patchwork identity. It's not no longer the idea of there's one identity every, everybody of us has in our interior uh, personality. We are losing the great narratives we already discussed yesterday about fascism or socialism. These are the great uh, narratives as uh, Lyotard, but we try to discuss local, smaller ideas. Because we have such as a pulverization of social realities, it means um, we are... Uh, we had lost the whole class structure of society and the Society is more and more uh, organized in milieus or individuals. So the consequence is a radical pluralism. We do not know what is the real truth. It is a, cons uh, a consequence of also uh, the discussion about constructivism. Um, Sloterdijk um, is talking about the post-exclusivism. That we, because we do not know what is the truth and what is the right way to develop a thing that we call landscape, um, we should include more possibilities, not only to interpret, but also to manifest in different ideas into the physical space. And what is very important, I think, to your pro uh, project is, we have a more and more higher... Um, affinity to historical things, to aesthetic things, but what is important, the things do not need to be authentic, but they just need to have the appearance of being old, of being beautiful and something else. And what is very in uh, important, we discussed yesterday about the hybridization. Modern thinking tried to um, talk in a dichotomic way about what we call reality. On the one side, for example, male and female, urban spaces and rural spaces, um, uh, landscape and cityscape and so on. Wrong or right. And in nowadays we know it is always a discursive process. So. When we talk about postmodern uh, age, we know that the social relations are more, more flexible. The typical family with uh, one woman, one man, and one child is uh, more or less history, um, living and working on the same place. We have an increasing mobility. Um, we have a decrease of the meaning of the traditional village, a reducing importance of neighborhoods, um, uh, an increasing um, function of networks outside, also outside the place we are living in. It's not the traditional neighborhood we usually walk, uh, work in and usually live in. We have. Uh, Especially, especially if you're a scientist, uh, your personal network all over the world. But what is very important, especially uh, if you're dealing with politics, um, we have a strong 
moment of disembedding. We are not lo no longer embedded in a local neighborhood, but nearly in the whole world. But we have a strong interest to re be re-embedded, but it is uh, connected to occasions, it is voluntary, and it is flexible. To make it clear, no longer parties are important for people, but citizens' initiatives, because they have a shorter uh, and less intensive um, degree of integration. So I will talk about the consequences. <coughs> The appropriated physical landscape we, we, we defined is very strongly connected to power because it's dictated by the economic necessity. It means if we do not uh, make agriculture, we won't uh, uh, live to, uh, perhaps not tomorrow, but the next year. It is modified by social informs norms and values. How to deal with physical space, it, it is completely uh, different in different parts of the world or even Europe. Generation of ge ge geographers uh, had uh, dealt with this topic. But we have also limits in the political will. We yesterday discussed about EU uh, agrarian policy. It is very intensive uh, political. And the development of the physical space is manifested also in the legally permitted. But this is only one side of the thing we are discussing. The other side is we also have in mind restrictions, what we can call, what we can discuss as landscape. And it's a more um, not so um, no, 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 it's a, perhaps it's a more important um, way of thinking about landscape. What we have learned, what is a landscape? It's a more intensive limit concerning to deal with landscape often as the physical space. So we can see the social of construction of landscape as a recursive process. It is defined or defined by <laughs> politics, by milieus, by experts, and uh, there's no uh, simple cause. This is a definition of landscape and this is the physical space is, is designed like this uh, uh, idea how landscape should be constructed or erected. And what is, what is very important also, we have not only the cognitive way of thinking about landscape, we have emotional relationships as well as aesthetic relationships. So, we come back to the constructivist perspective at first, it is important to think, to think uh, inclusively about landscape, not exclusively. We have to think about contingencies. It means what we call landscape can be interpreted by someone else in a completely different and perhaps cultural dif uh, different uh, defined way. So. If we talk about landscape, we just not, uh, uh, need, not need to talk about only about the physical space, but also the social landscape and the differentiated ways of constructing this social landscape. And what is very important, usually we have a definition as well as a social landscape, but also in the physical space by people who had the majority in power. And if you want to investigate how people who are the so-called minors in power, some expression by Rainer Paris, the minor, uh, minors in power, what needs do they have to landscape? It's a very important thing to discuss, and so we need to talk to people. Uh, what is their landscapes, because we are all experts and we have our special deformation professionnelle, as Hannah Arendt said. And last but not least, 
we have another ideal of especially, I think, German landscape. <coughs> and thank you for your attention. I hope you will accept some questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, the thing is that I would like to ask you who said the, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Which philosopher, actually? or which? Uh, because actually what you were saying at the beginning yes. is mainly this meaning, that the beauty is according to the, the person himself, yes or not? Yes. Okay. From my part, uh, from the, from the constructivist view of the world, um, the beauty is uh, uh, the consequence of a uh, social process. We are talking about what is beauty, and uh, I'm, here I come to the theory of uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Perhaps someone knows him. Pierre Bourdieu thinks there's an elite in the society um, which is uh, uh, built uh, from intellectuals, especially artists and uh, people who have lots of money, and they define what is the beauty. And there's a middle class who, write, who wants to, uh, to, to get these aesthetic values, but they do not have the time to talk about the whole day or half the day about aesthetics and arts and so on. They just say, if you have uh, uh, the picture of Caspar David Friedrich in mind, um, what you, you, you are only to read um, this picture if you have an immense knowledge about romantic uh, painting and so on. But uh, the normal people do not have the time to have a study of arts and so on to understand really this picture. They just say, oh, it's beautiful. And so they are not able to talk about this picture. But they are saying this picture is beautiful. So the upper class um, uh, tries to invent a new art or a new landscape to aestheticize it. And so they define what we can call beautiful. Perhaps uh, another example concerning landscape. Uh, 40, 20, 30 years ago, everybody says industrial landscape, old, old industrialized landscapes are ugly. And then artists start to make pictures from the old steel mills and so on, the steel, steel plants. And now it is accepted in large parts of the society and I'm relating uh, once more to my uh, questionnaire, uh, this 12 years ago and from, from last year, more and more of the population are thinking um, that old industrialized landscapes are interesting, attractive, perhaps not beautiful, perhaps sublime. I think I'm, I'm very interested which landscape will be performed as beautiful as or affordable or something like that, um, as next, because nearly everybody in the middle class is telling it's an interesting landscape. The topic of beauty is maybe partly instinctively in mankind. Uh, you know the so-called golden cis, by example, and I think there is a, a common sense about beauty deep in the mankind. It's an essentialist view. Uh, I'm not an essentialist, so uh, I'm sociologist. And uh, sure, uh, perhaps. But uh, if you're thinking about uh, the processes of defining something as beautiful, it's a social process. From my point of view, I'm always, uh, I have always uh, this, these discussions with people who are. Uh, much more in touch with other paradigms uh, of uh, uh, seeing the world. But it's not a constructivist view. And uh, I do not, uh, I cannot, perhaps it's like this, but I, I cannot uh, see that uh, um, we cannot prove this. It's a theory. Constructivist theory is, I think, a little bit more elaborated. I found it interesting when, when I was listening to also the sources you were mentioning, I felt a bit like in a time travel because I'm a German mm -hmm. and I more or less studied and 
taught with the same references that you were mentioning about. So this was very um, familiar to me. And then I thought, what does it mean to me now? And actually, it's interesting if you bring all these discussions about postmodernity and so on to the time where we are now as a university teacher and as a university teacher not in Germany, where the thoughts are a bit different, also because of the different context, and you find out that still we are at this point where our students have to learn that. A good example for that is right now we have a bachelor thesis in uh, Estonia in a place that is called Hinalin, which means Chinatown. For most people of um, Tartu, it's called like that because in this place, about 30 years ago, when the uh, Soviet army was still there, uh, people lived there who were from um, Middle Asian st uh, st states also because they were uh, Soviet soldiers. So those were the first time that people were seeing uh, people from, uh, from Asia. For most of our students, and they're all like 19, 20, 21, this place is really ugly. You can do whatever you want. You can do uh, post uh, pictures on Facebook and, and connotate that in a, in a positive way as a university teacher, as a landscape architect, and having a certain kind of aesthetics that we have built up. But it takes a long time. It takes about one or two months just to get the people or to get the students into this understanding. And yesterday evening we were at the hotel and I was standing at the bar to order a beer and I looked at the smartphones of some Americans uh, s sitting there looking at places to travel in Europe and all the places were the same like um, Colosseum and um, well the typical places that you were just looking at and they were uh, talking about that and, I, and then I thought <coughs> it's not easier, it's actually harder even to, to deal with that because the media, this idea of media disseminating down, like, like you said, like in the, um, the uh, distinction of uh, Bourdieu is not working in this way anymore. The same arguments or the same, uh, um, uh, the same uh, motors that are fueling the discussion on wind turbines from uh, NGOs somewhere in the countryside are in a bad way also um, fueling the way we look at landscape and we don't look at it in a very, um, or, or many young people don't look at it in a very um, differentiated, or differentiated way as we might have it in this dis kind of discussion. Because we have some uh, findings about this, and uh, uh, a doctoral student of uh, mine wrote his uh, doctoral thesis about this, this topic. Um, he found out um, that we still can use Bourdieu, but not in the society of, as a whole, but specific in different milieus. You have in every milieu such leader of a distinct taste. And it's, it is completely different from uh, different generations, from different milieus and so on. And uh, sure, if you go to the usual touristic market, and um, another, it's another uh, doctoral thesis uh, about uh, the social construction of tourist uh, landscapes. Um, we have also a distinction chain from individual tourists to uh, group tourists to, to, to mass tourism and so on. Um, and what to be needed to be seen is a little bit different. But what is typical, what you also dis uh, uh, said, uh, you reproduce the photos and the catalog by standing in the same pers uh, perspective and what you accept and what you not accept. People are, um, go up very early in the morning to have the Colosseum without people. Because we, uh, we have defined um, that uh, landscape or buildings and so on are, should not be um, populated by people, especially buildings only f have a sense with people, for example, football stadium. A football sta stadium without football supporters is a little bit annoying. So we have a special social, we have defined socially with ex which expectations we have concerning landscape or cityscape or hybrid landscape or something else. And we try to reprodu reproduce them, and so we reproduce for the <coughs> further society to call these things beautiful, sublime, and so on. 
Uh, yes, a little bit like Friedrich, I'm quite familiar with some of the, a lot of the material you're talking about. Uh, and uh, I've done quite a lot of kind of in, little experiments with the first year students, for example, uh, landscape architecture students. So they've already got an idea they want to study landscape, although when you talk to them about it, why did you do, want to do it? Um, I don't know really. Um, or uh, because it's easier than architecture. Or, um, yeah, anyway, so, <clears throat> but what I do is I show them. 20 pictures from all sorts of places, mostly ones that I guess they haven't been to, but with a few salted in that they, they might recognize. And these vary from ornate gardens to um, fairly stereotypically mundane agricultural land that could kind of be anywhere, an urban fringe and this kind of stuff. And I ask them a very simple question, not is it beautiful or ugly, but do they prefer it? on a scale of one to five, you know? So we're talking about preference, not necessarily trying to measure beauty. Now, almost every time, and I've done this for years and years and years with now hundreds and hundreds of students, the landscapes which score the most um, like statistically clustered frequency of preference on the high end of the scale are those of big mountains and lakes and big scenery and that kind of thing. Those landscapes which, all the urban landscapes, are ones which there's almost no pattern. And this shows, I think, the two, to me it shows a couple of things. Firstly, the embedded kind of socially constructed preference for nature, natural landscapes, mountains, the sublime, and all the rest of it, the picturesque, which I think in some countries is more embedded than others, but it's surprising when I have big bunches of Chinese students uh, or Japanese with different traditions, the same sort of things come out. And also when it comes to the man-made landscape, or let's say the most obviously man-made landscape like the city, some people see the same thing and thinking, yuck, that's really horrible, I don't, I don't like that at all. And others, oh, yeah, I really like that as well. And there's absolutely no pattern there. And that shows this pluralism and this inclusivism, and also the ways in which different people look at, look at places which offer different potentials, possibilities, have more history, all these, these kinds of things. So I think there's a number, you know, when you're talking about these things, and we all try to operationalize and understand this from a point of view of teaching students and dealing with it as landscape architects, uh, taking all this theoretical stuff and trying to make it work, when you're dealing with landscapes which have to be used by umpteen people, you know, a public space has to be, has to be used by, uh, well, we hope by everybody. Um, regardless of their age, their gender, their ethnicity, their socio-economic group and so on. And how do we try to design places which actually are going to be satisfying all the different preferences and those kinds of things, which is uh, another sort of thing. Anyway, again, more of an observation, but for, as, a, as somebody kind of dealing with this in the front end, like Friedrich with students, um, having to get them to understand this kind of plurality and this variability and this sociologically embedded and, and power constructed. You know, when you're taking national parks, for example, they've often been, been, been identified uh, by a bunch of experts or whatever on the basis, very largely, of, of this picturesque, sublime kind of characteristics, and that's become socially um, embedded in the tourism industry and in everything else. And then UNESCO and World Heritage Sites have become another kind of uh, branding tool. Sorry, I'm going on too long, aren't I? Yes, it was a small lecture, actually. Shut up. <laughs> yes. Shut up. <laughs> Perhaps what is interesting, I, I, I did the same. Uh, I showed pictures to my uh, first, when I my university before was Wein Stefan, landscape, uh, faculty of landscape architecture, and I started the same, uh, showing 10 pictures and asked them, I prefer the, uh, not, not only to, to the preference uh, uh, of that something, because I, I'd like to, to have a more differentiated view, like I have here, it's a typical, uh, perhaps it's a sociological way. But what is interesting, I, I, I did it with the students from the first semester, the third, the fifth and the seventh, and it changed. Because, sure, we uh, produced this deformation professionnelle. Um, and what is interesting, in mind, Stefan, we had uh, three uh, specializations, uh, landscape design, landscape planning, and uh, city planning. Landscape designers, as well as uh, uh, landscape planners changed their view 
to landscape um, to a very cognitive thinking. Even the preferences have changed. And what is interesting, the urban planners, after the third semesters, they had to think about all these things. They fall back into the layman or the layperson's interpretation of what we call landscape. Very stereotyped, not very differentiated. And I think it's very interesting that uh, um, the deformation professionnelle <coughs> is very strongly related uh, to the courses we are giving. So we have a completely different interpretation of what we call landscape from landscape planners and city planners. Thank you very much. Thank you all.